Well, thanks again. It's uh, great, great to be here and to see some old friends and so forth uh, in the audience. Um, I think our plan, I, I'm not going to do a deep introduction. You got a bit of an overview, except a couple of things, because it's mainly me going to be interviewing Frank. But I just say a couple of unique aspects about Frank. He is deep in the uh, mining industry, primarily in gold, uh, in, in the actual mining of it, uh, part of the industry, but also in the investment side of it with his experience at, at Yorkton uh, Securities, which he led for, ma for many years. And actually, he's also been in the entertainment business. I know he doesn't want to talk about that, but with Lionsgate, which may be something that we should apply to the mining industry to kind of help with our image uh, that uh, is out there. So there's probably many other chapters. But he's also the co-chair of the International Crisis Group, uh, which is, a, a, I think, a very important uh, agency, if you will, around the world looking at crises, getting perspectives, and actually helping on the ground in many of these situations, mm -hmm. whether it's with refugees or negotiations. So I think has a unique insight on that. So I, I thought there were, I, I would sort of focus a bit on the, um, the geopolitics side Can first. Can I first acknowledge? So, I want to acknowledge something. I want to acknowledge Dominic Sproul in securing the release of uh, our own Michael Kovrig, who was un uh, wrongfully detained in China for almost three years. And as you, when you were um, Canada's ambassador to China, you played a key role in uh, in getting his release. And we're forever. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, but I. I what I'd love to do, if it's all right, is just talk a little bit about the, let's start with the geopolitics, because that, that is affecting, we have this fundamental <coughs> supply-demand imbalance. We have huge demand uh, for critical minerals, but also basic metals uh, to be able to meet our net zero targets. And we, I'd love to hear some of your specifics on that. We have this huge gap that's complicated by a, a, an ever complicating geopolitical environment. So maybe we could talk about that. The other area is just to give you a headline. So we're going to talk a bit about geopolitics. Frank has also got some pretty strong views on de-dollarization, which I think is also interesting to think about, particularly as it also relates to gold. Um, and then what, what's been happening on, on that front. So those are some of the categories we're going to go through. But Frank, right. I may interrupt him because he, Frank, <laughs> we'll go on. We'll, so I may if, if not Thank, be, thanks be too rude, but I will interrupt him right. from time to time. Well, listen, I think, I think we should set the stage, first of all, why we're here today in, the, in this ever-shifting geopolitical landscape. Um, you know, the Western economies have had uh, their failing fiscal health and over-indebtedness, which resulted in money printing, which resulted in an increased wealth gap, which brought in populism and nationalism, uh, which also ushered in trade protectionism, deglobalization, which often, as if you study history, leads to some form of external conflicts. And I think the biggest one we have today is China-US. Um, they're both vying for the number one spot in, in the global economy. And you know, China's exercising its own version of the Monroe Doctrine with respect to the South China Sea. In other words, this is our neighborhood, and uh, this is causing a a conflict uh, with, with the United States. It was good to see Xi and Biden meeting the other week because I think the, and, and don't kid yourself, the only purpose of that visit was to es de-escalate tensions, to make sure that the lines of communication are open so that we don't stumble into World War III by accident. But you know, we've also got two other wars going on in the world that both have the potential of dragging in global powers into direct conflict. So it's a very fragile state, very dangerous state. I think we're at the dawn, uh, the beginning of perhaps a once in a century restructuring of the global order uh, with respect to the West and to the BRICS led by China. And I think that's gonna have an impact on, 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 on securing the minerals that are necessary for the energy transition. And you're seeing it. You're, you're seeing it already. Um, uh, the battle lines are being drawn. Uh, you've got uh, China putting export bans on graphite. You have Canada excluding China from crit the critical minerals list. You've got the US and Canada with their joint action plan on critical minerals. Um, and, 
And then you've got Africa. And Africa is an interesting place because it's very resource rich. And for a very long time, China was leading the charge in terms of developing those minerals in, uh, in exchange for infrastructure. Now you got the Wagner Group, a Russian, you know, Russian group there, acquiring a lot of mineral uh, claims. And I think the US is just waking up to that fact now. I know I've been approached, and others have been approached by representatives of the United States to go in there and compete. Uh, so I think that'll be the new battleground for, for minerals. Um, but you know, even around the world, you, you, know, you have Indonesia talking about creating an OPEC-style cartel on battery minerals. Although, you know, <laughs> I don't know if you saw, but you know, the G7 provided a $20 billion investment to convert from uh, coal to clean energy, so I'm not sure if that was motivated by, by that threat. And then you've got the rest of the world. You've got countries like Peru and, um, and Chile raising taxes on mining companies. You've got all sorts of tough, tougher regulations coming in. And I think it's the curse of the mineral industry. You know, that when you get commodity prices rising and when you have scarcity, countries tend to look to the foreign mining companies. Uh, and it's a sort of love <laughs> love-hate yeah. affair. It's a push-pull yeah. love affair. You know, when commodities are low, you know, they incentivize you to come in. And when, when things are robust, they try and tax you. And, you know, I mean, you've had your, Rio's got, has, has had its own issues in Mongolia. And there's, you know, there's been issues in Tanzania, the DRC, and the yeah. Kirk, Kirk Republic. So it's happening everywhere. So the result is you're going to have a fight over mineral scarcity because we're already going to be in a deficit regardless. You know, there's a deficit of copper, yeah, what, maybe just on that too, because yeah. it's an excellent sort of painting of the of the complication of the picture. But assuming there was no geopolitics, I'm just saying, what is the basic? You've written about this supply demand gaps. Just re, kind of center us again, so that we get. You think about copper. Um, you know, just we can go through yeah. lithium. I, I won't talk about copper all the time, even though I'm biased on that. <laughs> you know, even steel. But just what are Maybe just talk about the gaps, given what we need for this energy transition, and then what's the tax or cost of geopolitics on top of that? Maybe. Yeah, well, that's good. Well, you know, geopolitics aside, we have a deficit problem. Yeah. We have a, a metals deficit problem. I'm sure a lot of people, I'm not an expert in that, although I have written about it recently. Um, and there's a reason for that. It takes 10 to 20 years to put a mine into production. and Companies like Rio and others, you know, have to forecast way ahead. And uh, since 2011, when the, the last commodities boom came to an end, uh, mining companies have been very shy about investing. You know, they got severely spanked for overpaying at the top of the market, and then, you know, having to write down some of these investments over the last sort of decade. So, the majors haven't been really investing. So. I think, and I wrote about this, you know, I think uh, traditionally it's been the junior mining companies, a lot of you in this room, that have discovered and developed these projects, and eventually they get taken over by, by the senior mining companies if they, if they work. And I think there has to be more of that. And I think the problem with the junior sector is that it's starved for capital. And what I said in the article was, well, you've got all of these very cash-rich senior mining companies, you've got all these junior companies looking to develop deposits that are starved for cash, why not invest as a senior mining company, invest in some of these companies? And then some will work. You know, it's a risky business, some will work. And that'll be your feed for, for the next generation. Because you're gonna have, otherwise, especially copper, as you, you're, I'm sure you're well aware, we have a huge copper deficit in the next 20, 30 years if we're gonna achieve net zero. Yeah, I mean, some of the numbers we, we've looked at and they're there are many people out, the IEA in particular has put this out, but we're looking at basically uh, 2040, uh, we're gonna have on an annual basis, a demand for 45 million tons of copper a year and 20 million tons of supply. And that's with some pretty heroic assumptions about mines that have been discovered that will be built. So this is humongous, uh, the, the gap just on copper. Even lithium, which is going through a a bit of a uh, uh, you know price drop right now. There's huge supply demand imbalance just given what we see with the batteries uh, and and how that's going to move. And we could go through many other commodities, even steel. If you think about the amount of steel that's required in a seven megawatt wind turbine, it's about uh, 800 
pounds of or tons, sorry, tons of steel uh, that you need in that for 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 this. Um, let alone the distribution network for electricity, uh, where, where I think we're talking the order of 80 million kilometers uh, that need to be built by 2050 uh, to be able to do it. So, so huge demand. But what's what do you think? I'm just just gut ball that what this geopolitical tension. What does that? How does that? Does that make it worse? Is it? Is it because you, you definitely you're going to see it on inflation. Um, you're going to see it. Supply chains are not going to work as effectively as they are. A lot of the, a lot of the concentration in the processing and so forth is being done actually in China yep. and, and Russia. But what's your sense of the? cost of that? Well, I think it's definitely going to result in much higher prices for, for, for the metals, which translates into inflation for the rest of the world. And I think more importantly, the potential for conflict. And many wars have been fought in the past over commodities. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of times wars about, are about resources. And that's what scares me the most. When we can get through inflation, we can get through all sorts of things. But in today's world, if you pit China and Russia against the West and, you know, and you've got the Middle East, you know, with Iran and Israel, um, and you know, there, there are a lot of problems out there that um, that could ignite a global war, and that's what worries me. Yeah. Uh, but I think definitely it's going to be much higher metal prices in due course. Yeah. I, one other element too is we're seeing other investors that are coming in to go alongside my, because of the geopolitical risk, and this is where I think in the I think some very interesting things happening in the Middle East, where the Middle East seems to be able to operate well, both in the East and the West. Um, and are there, just thinking, of, when we think about our traditional investors as mining companies, we think about, uh, you know, Anglo-Saxon mm. capital markets, but I think there's a new set of capital markets that have developed. I don't know yeah. what your sense is of well, just... Uh, well, I'm sure you're, you're well aware of, you know, China, obviously looking to Saudi Arabia, to Iran, to the UAE, uh, to develop these relationships for long-term energy supplies and uh, reciprocal investment into those countries to deaccumulate the yuans that would obviously, they would like to be paid in yuans, and, and they're doing it with certain countries like Iran, Russia, and Venezuela, but, um, and obviously they're trying to internationalize the yuan. But uh, I think that, you know, if the Middle East countries uh, that we just talked about are going to play both sides, you know, they're going to want their relationship with the West, with the United States, but they also want uh, a good relationship with China. And so it's going to be a competition. And I think they're going to manage those relationships very carefully. Yeah. And perhaps even in Africa, too. I think there's opportunity. You mentioned Africa, but, you know, it's a rich area of resources. Uh, also, the parts of Central Asia as well. Were yeah, and the, and the problem with Africa is, I don't know if you've watched recently, in the last three years you had uh, 14 coups, military coups or coup attempts. We haven't seen that in decades. Yeah. And, you know, in the, in the hands of certain powers are in, 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 in behind, be, behind the scenes playing a role in those, in those coups. So it is a battleground. And, and I, like I said earlier, Africa is a very resource-rich continent. Um, and it's going to, you know, it's going to be a competition yeah. for these resources. So can we just shift a bit? You've, you've written a lot about de-dollarization, um, and how, you know, maybe just to talk a little bit about that, and what what could some of the implications of that be on the mining yeah. sector? Well, it, it's no secret that you know, that post two thousand and eight, when the uh, the Fed printed a lot of money and. Uh, there were all these bailouts. China started advocating for a change in the monetary system, and it mostly fell on deaf ears. Um, and they've been talking about it ever since. But it wasn't really until um, Russia invaded Ukraine that, and you know, the West seized Russian dollar reserves and eliminated them from the SWIFT settlement system, that the idea of de-dollarization really took hold. And if you think about it from the perspective of the global South, you know, they've been wanting this, a change for years, an alternative to the U.S. dollar, because if you think about it, commodities are priced in U.S. dollars. Uh, so the U.S. is exporting inflation to these lower income countries. And, um, and a lot of these low income countries also have to service their debt in U.S. dollars. So it's, you know, they've all wanted to have a change, but, you know, they were afraid to challenge the West. Now, 
since the Ukraine war, with China and Russia leading the charge towards de-dollarization and China working with the BRICS to, to, to de-dollarize, the Global South has found some courage and voice to say, yes, we want to do this. And you're hearing this from around the globe. And the other part of it was that they, you know, the sanctions put the fear into many other countries. Who's going to be next? Can the U.S. or the West sanction who's ever next on the naughty list? And so for that reason, they've been selling dollars, and we'll talk about the gold part of it later on, but you know, they've been trying to sell their dollars to diversify out of U.S. dollars, which they were overweighted on. And it's going to have an impact. Um, and I think that for a long time, the U.S. didn't pay a lot of attention to the ramifications of de-dollarization, but they're quite serious if it happens rapidly, or even over a long period of time, because what would happen is that America would have to have much higher inflation, higher interest rates, and a lower standard of living. They've lived very well off of a very overpriced dollar for a very long time. And it's only because the dollar is used as the middleman for all transactions around the world. So, so what's happening? So there's conversations taking place. There's conversation about a BRICS currency, and maybe it's going to be a gold-backed BRICS currency. Okay, that could happen. I think it's, uh, it'll be challenging. It'll take a number of years, but it could happen. There's, um, there's uh, the uh, China trying to internationalize the yuan, and I think that there's uh, a possibility that China will back the yuan somewhat with gold. Um, there's been talks about a BRICS coin, which would be backed by commodities. I, I think that that's probably very cumbersome. It's going to be impossible to manage. But in the meantime, what is actually happening is that you have almost daily now the conversations about new bilateral trade agreements in local currencies. And you're seeing it everywhere. And it's all meant to bypass the US dollar as the middleman. And you're seeing it between I mean, uh, India and Malaysia, North Korea and Indonesia, um, India and, uh, and the UAE with the trading in dirhams. Um, and you got Ghana offering to pay uh, for oil with gold. You've got the president of Kenya talking to the African neighbors about dumping the US dollar and trading bilateral currencies. So all these things will chip away. Mm. And eventually, so you're going to have a mishmash of uh, a multipolar world with weakly dominant currencies chipping away at the use of the US dollar for trade and settlement purposes. And that, over time, will reduce the demand for dollars. Um, and eventually, you'll get a competitor to the US dollar, and I think that's gonna happen. What it's either gonna be the yuan, or it could be this, This uh, I don't know if you've watched what China's doing with the, the M-Bridge project, which is using a central bank digital currency, and they ran a test pilot with the UAE and Thailand for settlement purposes to completely outside the US dollar system. So it's all done through ledgers you know, of, of, of digital currencies, central bank to central bank. And now you've got 130 or so countries around the world testing central bank digital currencies. And those would be very convenient to do trade with. Mm. And again, it would eliminate the need for US dollars. So all these things are happening. And, 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 and what, I, if, what, do you, what impact would that have? And obviously, it changes the economic system. It has a big effect on the US economy. But in terms of mining, let's say, what, what are some things that we're not thinking about that we should be thinking about, given uh, that trend? How commodities are going to be priced, right. <laughs> because that's that's the big one, right? Yeah. They've been traditionally priced in U.S. dollars. So if you take the U.S. dollar premium out of, you know, the commodity pricing, it's going to be a lot cheaper. And I think it's going to be. I I personally believe that an alternative, whatever that looks like, will be beneficial to low-income countries, because it's very expensive to deal through the U.S. dollar system. Now the U.S. is not going to like this, and they're going to fight. They've already they were a little bit slow to wake up. But they've already started the, the, narrative, the war narrative against de-dollarization in the same breath uh, dismissing it and warning of the implications. And they're using all sorts of language to, to scare away people from thinking about this. But it's real and it's going to happen. And is this, this maybe into the, our third and final part of the discussion on the on gold, buy, buying of gold by central banks? You've been yeah. tracking this quite 
yeah. carefully. What is probably related to that? But what? How do you tell us more about? Yeah. That, so yeah, I, I've been writing about gold for over 20 years now, and um, back in 2010, it was just post post the 2008 crisis. Central banks around the world, which had been absent from the gold market for quite a long time, started accumulating gold. 13 years now, and it's accelerating. Last year, 2022, we broke an all-time record of gold buying by central banks. This year, we're probably on track to do an equal amount or more. Um, and where's most of this gold going? East. Hmm. China and India account for half of the gold buying. 46,000 tons of gold have, since 1995 have moved from west to east. Hmm. And the vaults in the west are being emptied, and, uh, and, and they're going all east. And, and I think... Why is that? Why is that? Because I think... Again, going back to the fear of sanctions, there's no counterparty risk of gold. So you can't see, if you have gold in your central bank, you're not gonna have a problem with sanctions. It's also a great diversifier. When you see the failing economies in the West and the over-indebtedness, why, why be overweight in a fiat currency? Why not be in something that works well when fiat currencies fail? And thirdly, if you, as an example to this, and if you watch what happens when a currency fails, uh, and you saw it in Turkey, over the last three, uh, three years, gold has gone up tenfold in price in Turkish lira terms. It's gone up fivefold, uh, sorry, fivefold in Turkey, tenfold in Argentina, and the really scary one is Japan. Japan, the third biggest economy in the world, gold has doubled over the last three years in yen terms. So that's what happened when currencies start to fail. And if you look, and I think that the mistake that most of us make is we look at cross-currency rates as a measure of the value of fiat currencies, and that's the wrong way to look at it. You have to measure them against gold because it's the only thing that can't be printed. And so you know, trying to choose between different fiat currencies that are all overprinted is like trying to choose between going on a cruise on the Bismarck or the Titanic. They're all gonna go down. Eventually, and and no, but it's happening. Look, I mean, look at the U.S. situation right now. Thirty-three trillion dollars in federal debt. The CBO, nonpartisan CBO, is projected two trillion two trillion dollar deficits every year for the next ten years. So add another twenty trillion dollars in ten years, take you to fifty-three trillion dollars. They're predicting a hundred trillion dollars of baseline deficits in the next thirty years, and you try and service that with five percent interest. I mean, you know. That's why I believe that this, you know, this, the Fed talking about higher for longer interest rates is just BS because, you know, it's, that's going to go the way of transitory inflation, that term, you know. It's not going to last because they can't, they simply can't function. They, 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 you just have to do the math. How are they going to service all that debt? So I think that the U.S. dollar is going to have problems like every other fiat currency that's overprinted and overindebted. And so that's why people are going to go. And the central banks, you know, I always say, if you want to see the truth, follow the money and follow the true money. And, and they're all buying gold in, 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 in very large quantities. And I think that that's going to continue. Yeah. So, so really some worrying shifts, long-term pressures that you're seeing in the, in not only in, the ge in geopolitics, but in the global financial system, which will affect it from, a, again, a very selfish, narrow point of view. If you're in commodities, that's probably a good thing. Not, well, it, you, <clears throat> yeah, I think both in, in terms of what we talked about, the scarcity of commodities yeah. and the, you know, the working to work towards electrifying the world and, I, and those things, but also I think that, uh, that the, the way we look at commodities is the lens of U.S. dollars right now, and I think that's going to change. Yeah. One, one other aspect, just back to the, again, on the geopolitics and the scarcity side of things, one, you know, we've talked about this before, but, you know, China accounts for up to over 80 percent, some cases 90 percent, in the processing of some of the critical minerals and rare earths. Um, and so there's a sense of people wanting to diversify from that. But then when you get into things like permitting uh, and the ability to do it, so there's a lot of rhetoric about doing it, but what actually happened, you know, and the fact is it's easier, faster to get things done in China. Uh, so or China in Africa. <laughs> China and Africa, right? But how? How? What? What are the implications of that? If, as you you've got a global perspective on where, 
think, well, and as you, you also mentioned, you know, in some of the South American countries, it's getting more difficult uh, to be able to operate, whether through a tax regime or a changing fiscal regime. But what, what are some imperatives on that front? Well, I, I don't know how, we're, how the West will be able to compete with countries that, that had operate by a different set of rules. So China, you know, operates by a different set of rules when they invest in certain countries. You know, they're offering investment in return for resources. And they don't talk about human rights. They don't talk about any of the things that the West has traditionally talked about. So it's, I think it's going to be a, an incredible competition. I don't know. You know, I, like I said, I've been approached, as I'm sure many others have been approached, by um, or American representatives, it's, you know, suggesting, you know, how do we get people like you to come to Africa and invest? And I, my answer is always simple. It's like, I don't know how to compete. <laughs> you know, we, we have a different set of rules here. So, you know, and, and then you look at the, the Wagner, Wagner group from Russia, you can't compete with them at all. I mean, you know, they, they, you know they, they play by a completely different set of rules. So I don't know. I just think it's going to be very competitive. And I think that, you know, and you marry that with the, I, what's happening in places like Peru and Chile. Um, and I think it, it's, it's a resource war in the making. Mm -hmm. I hope it doesn't get there, but it's a resource war in the making. Yeah. One of the things we've, um, irrespective of Africa, but in China is there's actually a lot of change in terms of advanced manufacturing. I mean, they, it's also the efficiency and the technology that they're using to process things uh, well. We've been, during this COVID period, I know I'm just real going there and looking at the changes that have been made. But it's not a, it's not a popular, those are not popular industries in North America. Um, so I'm not, you've, you've talked a bit about this too, and I, I do want to go back to the image of our industry. Yeah. And you, again, you have multiple lenses to look at that. What are, how, how can we, and you've written about a, a dirty but necessary industry. How, how, what are some things we could be doing to shift that image? And it, and it is an image problem. As yeah. you know, as the chairman of Rio, you know, mining, when it's done by large corporations, it's done properly. And I think we sometimes get thrown into the mix of illegal and informal miners in many of these countries. Is he dying here? Um, well, they're sending us a signal. Okay, they're trying to kick yeah. us off. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I think it is an image problem. Yeah. I think that, I don't know, we just have to work harder to get across to what I call the TikTok generation, that, that um, mining is, when done properly, is not a dirty business. And we stop boycotting investing in mining. And as I'm sure you're well aware, there are many funds around the world that just avoid mining completely. And it's so, so arbitrary, it doesn't make sense. And I think it is an image problem. I think we, I th I think we have a PR problem. <laughs> Well, good. Well, I'm getting the signal to uh, to wind up. Um, right. Frank, thank you so much for that uh, broad perspective on all the changes that are going on. Thank you so much. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. That was good. Thank you. Thank you.